tonight. The demolition of a homeless encampment in Regina has people wondering what progress is being made to help people on the streets. Also, after pausing in January, the Bank of Canada is once again raising lending rates. Plus, the cuts have been made, the preseason is over, and the riders are ready to start the regular season this coming weekend. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Wednesday, June 7th, and the CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. A wrecking crew destroyed a homeless encampment in Regina this morning. Now, community organizations are once again demanding more assistance for people on the streets. Nicholas Fruit reports. This is all that remains of what some people called home. A man and two children set up camp on a vacant lot downtown about four months ago. Wednesday morning, another homeless man was surprised when heavy machinery moved in and they were suddenly forced to leave. Well, what was the problem? If the mayor won't look after us, then who will? Members of the Regina Police Service were on the scene to make sure no one got hurt. Police say they have known about this camp and others for some time and officers stop by daily to connect people to various supports. But police didn't know who was tearing down the camp or why. It was on private property and one man said he had permission to pitch his tent there. CBC News contacted the city of Regina for comment, but did not receive a response before deadline. This camp was not the first to pop up in Regina, nor was it the largest. But its destruction has community organizations wondering what progress has actually been made toward addressing homelessness in the city. This is a really prime example of the lack in Saskatchewan when it comes to housing and funding and mental health and addictions. Like, this is it right here. This is, this is the reality of living in Regina. Shiloh Stevenson says people trying to turn their lives around face systemic obstacles. He listed obtaining ID as a big challenge. We're still no further ahead than we were at Camp Hope. We do have other places like the Nest and, and things like that, but they're seeing the same things, that there's just no step forward. What is our next step? And it's just uh, social services needs to do a lot more at this point to provide or reduce those barriers. SGI needs to remove some of those barriers. Um, we just need some more support in that capacity for this. The man and two children were moved into a motel by community agencies and will have shelter for at least a few days. Nicholas Fru, CBC News, Regina. Some severe weather rolling through the province again this hour. Our weather specialist Ethan Williams is here with a quick update. Well, wouldn't you know, Sam, all the severe thunderstorm warnings have dropped off for the moment now, but we still do have some cells popping up uh, in the province. Southwestern Saskatchewan is where we've seen them today, despite the fact that there really wasn't supposed to be severe weather in that area of the province. So cells now crossing the Trans-Canada Highway, roughly between Swift Current and uh, the Moose Jaw area right now, and a few popping up around uh, the Cypress Hills and Maple Creek area as well. And then we head to southeastern Saskatchewan. These cells beginning to die off. All of these cells moving very slowly northward and some heavy rain will likely be the main threats here. There was reports of nickel to ping pong ball sized hail. Severe thunderstorm watch remains in effect for all of southern Saskatchewan, including the Regina area as well. There are also heat warnings in effect for extreme southeastern Saskatchewan. Temperatures much above normal. Once again today, some 10 degrees in portions of the southeast. But those warnings likely going to be coming to an end in the coming day here, Sam, and I'll let you know why coming up a little bit later. Thanks, Ethan. You bet. The Bank of Canada has raised its key interest rate to 4.75%, an increase of 25 basis points. It's the first time since January that rates have been hiked. Nisha Patel has the details. For anyone with a variable rate mortgage, borrowing is about to get more expensive. The Bank of Canada hiked its key interest rate for the first time since January. It's now at 4.75% the highest level since 2001. The central bank had paused in January to see if eight aggressive rate hikes would be enough to get inflation under control. But Canada's economy hasn't slowed enough. The housing market has picked up and the labour market remains tight. And with the latest inflation rate ticking higher, the Bank of Canada moved to raise rates, saying concerns have increased that CPI inflation could get stuck 
above the 2% target. A lot of consumers will be facing those, those dual dynamics right now of high inflation, high interest rates, and other, and other types of challenges as we kind of see potentially a slowing economy at the same time. The Bank of Canada uses higher interest rates as a tool to slow spending and cool the economy. But some analysts aren't convinced they're the correct fix. Geopolitical reconfiguring because of supply lines, uh, climate change events, extreme climate uh, change events, all of these things are cranking up prices. And raising rates isn't necessarily the right medicine. However, it's the only medicine we have relied on since the 1980s. The Bank of Canada says it will monitor inflation to determine whether even higher interest rates are necessary. Many market watchers are betting the central bank isn't finished, predicting another rate hike in July. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. Speaking of money, some stark numbers out of Saskatoon City Hall today. The city is facing a $52 million shortfall as it begins to hammer out next year's budget. That means if there are no cuts to services, residents would face a property tax increase of 18.5%. If you can relate it to your household, I think that's a lot of tough decisions that businesses and, and residents had to make in their own um, personal lives, and, this, and the city's no different. We have to find that balance between what you know, is the service level and um, what citizens and residents and, and the city can afford going forward. So we'll definitely be trying to find that right balance, and, and everything's on the table at this point. As I mentioned, um, you know, nobody's happy presenting these numbers. Administration's not happy. We don't expect residents, businesses, or city council to be happy with where the numbers are at right now. It will be the job of administration and city council to bring those numbers down before the city's budget is finalized in November. The chief financial officer said inflation, growth, and some budget adjustments are the main pressures facing the city. Revenues also didn't bounce back after the pandemic as much as the city had hoped. Now, as the city of Saskatoon wrestles with a budget shortfall, the city of Regina is looking to take on more debt. City Council has a long list of projects it wants to build. As Alexander Kwan reports, it needs to find the money to pay for it all. There are some hard conversations coming forward and related to our projects. A blunt warning to Regina City Council on their bold ambitions to build a series of mega projects and the increasing costs that they will face. It all comes as council has approved a plan to raise the city's debt limit, which is one of the ways that it is able to build large projects. Regina's debt limit is currently capped at $450 million, and the city is getting very close to that ceiling. Around half of its debt is from building Mosaic Stadium. But there are more projects on the horizon, including a new central library and a potential downtown arena, as well as a need to upgrade Regina's aging infrastructure. And that's why on Wednesday, City Council approved a plan to ask the province to boost its debt limit to $780 million. Uh, is in part to provide council and the city the flexibility uh, when opportunities present themselves to advance these critical projects. And perhaps there's other ones that might come up or that are deemed to be a higher priority by council. One of the projects that is going to benefit from the city's increased debt ceiling is an upgrade to the city's water infrastructure. Residents in the city's east end are complaining about low water pressure. That's a problem for those wanting to water their plants or have a shower, but of particular concern for emergency services like the fire department. Any additional development means low water pressure will spread to other areas of town. Constructing a new pumping system could alleviate the concerns and help the city grow for the future. With costs increasing, council just approved an increase to the project's budget, though is not without heated debate. Remember, we work together on this council. Some of the biggest costs for infrastructure is water and wastewater. If the province signs off on the debt limit increase, then the city will immediately put $100 million towards the water infrastructure. Alexander Kwan, CBC News, Regina. A new free program to help Canadians improve their employment skills will soon be delivered out of the University of Regina. It's thanks to a $9.3 million grant from Employment and Social Development Canada's Skills for Success program. The Canadian program in creativity, innovation and entrepreneurship will launch in December and will be completely online. It's targeted mostly toward high school and post-secondary students. There are eight modules that will help them find jobs or start their own businesses. 
stand here today amongst brilliant, brilliant individuals with profound sense of optimism and gratitude. This program, spearheaded by the University of Regina, recognizes this immense potential that women entrepreneurs have in, in the importance of bring, bridging the gender entrepreneurship gap. The program will also include content about unique opportunities and challenges that exist for women-led and Indigenous-led entrepreneurial ventures. The funding was secured by the U of R's Paul J. Hill School of Business and the Kenneth Levine Graduate School of Business. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders were back on the field today in preparation for the first game of the season this Sunday. The new look Rough Riders got through training camp, cuts and practiced for about two hours this afternoon. The Riders' new franchise quarterback, Trevor Harris, will lead a revamped offense. Harris played only one series in the preseason, but went 4-4 four for four with a touchdown pass. He says the team's ready to get things started. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. It feels like game week. And, you know, you get to come out here in Mosaic and play in this beautiful stadium and, um, you know, obviously go through the meetings, the install, and, you know, get here and get some workouts in and stay after and watch some film together. And it uh, just feels like, you know, there's a game coming up and, you know, CFL game on tomorrow night. You know, you get excited to go home and watch that and uh, watch some CFL football and the season's here and man, it just hypes you up, doesn't it? The Rough Riders could be without three projected starters on Sunday. Slotback Braden Lenius, offensive lineman Philip Blake, and linebacker Derek Moncrief all missed practice due to injury. Kick kickoff on Sunday in Edmonton against the Elks is at 5 p.m. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Well, if you saw people walking out of Victoria Park with tiny trees today, it was totally above board. The city of Regina gave away seedlings to celebrate being named the Tree City of the World by the UN for the fourth year in a row. Four varieties were up for grabs. If you missed out, the city says expect another giveaway come September for National Tree Day. Stay with us. Ethan will have your forecast after the break. There are more than 400 wildfires burning across the country, with close to 240 of them out of control. Emergency Preparedness Minister Bill Blair took stock of the unprecedented wildfire season so far. There are 2,293 wildfires that have occurred in Canada. Approximately 3.8 million hectares have been burned. Officials in Quebec say this wildfire season is the worst on record. 150 fires are burning, and a number of evacuees is expected to hit 15,000 by the end of today. Fires in Canada are sending smoke to cities south of the border, too, including Michigan, Illinois, New York, and Washington. This weather update is brought to you by Mercedes-Benz Regina, proud member of the Capital Automotive Group. And our weather specialist, Ethan Williams, joins me now. We may not have the smoke down south, but the fires are still burning in Saskatchewan, and there are some air quality statements still in place. Yeah, that's right. And in, in northern Saskatchewan is where we are seeing that. We'll take a look at uh, where those are exactly here. The Uranium City area uh, over to Stony Rapids and down to Lalosh, uh, Clearwater River is uh, where those are in place right now and they are expected to be in place for the next little while here. Of course, you see all of northern Alberta under that uh, advisory too. Now, of course, eastern in Canada, you don't usually see, as we heard in that story, th this kind of level, this magnitude of fires and the smoke as well. But here in Western Canada, you know, we're kind of more used to that. But we actually just came through uh, a pretty significant period of air quality uh, that was lowered in the Buffalo Narrows Isle Lacrosse area. In fact, here's some stats for you. Uh, an air quality statement went into place in the Buffalo Narrows area this season on May 4th at around 835. It didn't end until Saturday at 110, so almost a month under an air quality health advisory in Buffalo Narrows and Isle Lacrosse. That's about 715 consecutive hours. So uh, for those of you up north, even that is incredibly long, even though you do face those forest fires uh, a lot, especially as we get into the summer. And that risk now increasing through much of the province in the Buffalo Narrows Isle across region, some pockets of extreme risk there as that hotter, drier air begins to build in. We are seeing those yellows and reds start to reappear. And of course, temperatures driving that. We're seeing a lot of us close to 30 degrees, even up in uh, around Collins Bay today. Uh, we have seen the mid to upper 20s, a good swath of the province in that region. Now, here 
here's the thing. Thunderstorms in southern Saskatchewan have actually dropped temperatures. Our cool spot right now is swift current at Ooh. 20 degrees, and it, uh, we were actually below that a little bit earlier this afternoon. And again, you factor in the Humidex, and uh, we're, we're feeling like the mid-30s in Regina and Yorkton and much of eastern Saskatchewan. We do have a severe thunderstorm warning that has been issued for areas to the west of Moose Jaw up toward the Davidson area. Nickel to ping pong ball-sized hail in this cluster of storms that's moving northeastward through the Eyebrow and Davidson areas right now. Thunderstorms expected to continue in the south tonight. High pressure will keep central and northern Saskatchewan clear, but some fog is possible in the overnight hours. The severe threat continues to shift eastward tomorrow as this high pressure dries us out and drops the humidity and will likely drop heat advisories as well. But there still is a chance that we could see showers and thunderstorms in the south tomorrow before we all clear out as we head into Friday. Again, that risk getting smaller and smaller with similar threats. All of the south under a minor risk for severe weather tomorrow. So keep that in mind as you plan your day. And you can see there, Regina, uh, we are now out of the heat uh, warning as that humidex continues to drop off. Off. That will continue to do so as we head through these next few days. High pressure means we are very sunny, but still getting close to the 30 degree mark. And uh, those overnight lows still well into the teens. Uh, Going to be a while here before we see any measurable rainfall, especially in Saskatoon and central Saskatchewan, where uh, you are uh, just as hot as southern Saskatchewan. Again, chance of maybe some thunderstorms on Monday, but the temperature staying quite high. So less of a human X factor means that uh, maybe you can open up those windows tonight, Sam but still going to be stifling. But don't we need the humidity to prevent the forest fires? That too, yes. We could, we could use that to, to shift north a little bit. We can't win right now. <laughs> no, we can't. All right, thanks, Ethan. You bet. Well, from one kind of smoke and fire to another, this won a spectacular show of fire and brimstone. One of the world's most volatile volcanoes erupted this morning in Hawaii. It's the second time this year the mountain has spewed out a toxic mix of lava and gas. The area is off limits to the public, so there is little chance of injury this time. But experts monitor this gurgling mountain around the clock. We'll be back after the break. Families are struggling today in southern Ukraine. Many swamped and homes flooded with contaminated water. Officials say the damage from the massive dam that was destroyed yesterday is extensive and will take years to recover. Briar Stewart explains. In the city of Kherson, residents who've lived through war for more than a year now have to be rescued by boat. We have become used to the shelling, said this woman. But a natural disaster like this is a nightmare. Animals are stranded too, surrounded by floodwaters, tainted with whatever has been swept up. Thousands of houses. This MP could smell fuel while down at the Dnipro River. Hundreds of tons of engine oil with the bodies of dead animals. All of this is moving to the Black Sea. Officials say it could take a week for the water to recede, much longer to get a true sense of the environmental damage. These images show dead fish at the drained bottom of the dam's reservoir. Ukraine says that hundreds of thousands of people have been left without drinking water. This official says they will bring it in by train and by car. The defense ministry released this video of a drone apparently dropping off water too. Satellite images show that the Nova Kahovka Dam had recently sustained structural damage even before it burst. The dam was under control by Russian forces, and so were communities on the south side of the Dnipro River. This man's house is now filled with the putrid mix of water and sewage. There's no help from the authorities, he says, so he'll be left cleaning up on his own. The war can't go on forever. It must end sometime, he says. We're staying here for now. Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan spoke with both the President of Ukraine and the President of Russia. In his phone call with Vladimir Putin, he reportedly said that there needs to be an international investigation into the dam's destruction, and it could include the UN. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. 
Mike Pence, Donald Trump's former vice president, has thrown his hat into the ring, announcing today that he will run against the former president for the Republican nomination. The answer, Iowa, is strong, conservative, Republican leadership back in the White House. Pence trails both Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis in what many are calling a two-way race in a field of about a dozen candidates. While Pence has not been openly critical of his former boss, it is rare for a former U.S. vice president to run against a president that he served under. Prince Harry was in a London court for a second day testifying against Mirror Group newspapers over alleged phone hacking. But as Chris Brown reports, he faces major challenges in proving his case. The prince, who claims he has endured unending and much of it illegal media scrutiny since he was a child, is trying to convince a judge to hold a British newspaper publisher accountable. Harry was cross-examined for the second straight day in a series of combative exchanges with lawyers for the Mirror Group newspapers. The company has previously settled 600 claims for illegally intercepting voicemails, but says Harry was never hacked. In court, both sides sparred over a selection of 33 stories, many focusing on Harry's relationship with a former girlfriend, Chelsea Davey. He claimed a private investigator put a tracking device on their car. The newspaper reports that he went drinking at a club after being dumped had to have originated from hacked phone calls. The Mirror lawyers say that's just speculation. Under cross-examination, Harry was asked to point to any specific voicemail that he knows with certainty was hacked. He couldn't, instead saying there is only hard evidence of suspiciousness that many were. I think we've seen a lack of detail, perhaps. Media lawyer Antonia Foster says a major challenge is that many of the calls or voice messages are now irretrievable. I mean, they go back to 1996, and so, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you what was on my phone a year ago, and I, I suspect Harry's in, in that particular situation. Much will depend on how the journalists who wrote the stories explain themselves. Jane Kerr, a former Mirror Royal editor, testified immediately after Harry while he stayed in court to listen. She says she didn't know how a private investigator obtained phone numbers, and she never asked him. Harry was on the stand for eight hours in total over the two days. He testified if the decision, which is still weeks away, goes against him, it would be an injustice. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. And Ethan is back with one last look at your weather. And still possibly unsettled tomorrow morning in Regina. There is a chance that we could see some thunderstorms in the morning at 20 degrees. But as we head to the afternoon, those thunderstorms still possible. There is a slight risk that we could see severe storms tomorrow afternoon. But a humid X of 30 going to feel quite comfortable compared to today. Drier in Saskatoon, though, by the time we get to tomorrow morning. And sunnier as well. That high pressure really locked in place. Winds not too bad from the north. Just a bit of a light breeze. And a similar humid X for you tomorrow. Again, another hot day. 27 degrees. Severe thunderstorm warnings continue for the RMs of Arm River and Wood Creek with nickel-sized uh, hail possible there and for the RMs of Rokenville and Spy Hill as this cell slowly begins to move out of the province. That area, southeastern Saskatchewan, uh, could see severe storms again tomorrow. So yet another day, Sam, to uh, keep our eyes to the sky. All right. Thanks, Ethan. You bet. And that is it for us tonight. For news anytime, you can always head to cbc.ca slash sask or Subscribe to our CBC Saskatchewan YouTube channel. Ethan will be back with more local news at 11. We're back tomorrow at 5.30 ahead of NHL hockey playoffs. Thanks for watching and have a great night.